Cause like a winter From wherever you are around the world, welcome and thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be exploring the psychology of neo-paganism and witchcraft. We have with us today is Dr. David Waldron. He's a lecturer of history and anthropology at Federation University. He's also the author of these wonderful books, The Sign of the Witch, Shock, the Black Day of Bungie, and Snarls from the Tea Tree. Aren't those great names? I love them too. Let's welcome to the circle Dr. Waldron. Welcome to the circle, sir. Thank you very much. Really fun books. The Sign of the Witch actually is really interesting to me. Um, I can't believe it's back. But before we get to that, I want to find out a little bit more about what the definition of, of paganism is. And then maybe you could also give us a definition of neo-paganism. All right. Well, to start off with discussing what paganism is, one of the first things I'd like to bring up is that it's a very... Uh, complicated term in that it's mostly being used as a pejorative against people who weren't part of one of the major monotheistic traditions, uh, Judaism, Christianity and Islam. The other side to bring up is that its meaning has changed significantly over time. Um, the definition I particularly like to use is from a historian called Pierre Chauvin, also taken up by a historian I greatly um, admire, Ronald Hutton from Bristol uh, University. And he talks about it in terms of gods of the pagus. That is, there were the religions at the time of the Roman Empire which were based in your locality and ethnicity in comparison to the state temple religions of Rome and also the cosmopolitan multi-ethnic religions of Christianity, Manichaeanism, Mithraism and so on that anyone could follow. And if you think of it in those terms, I find it's very helpful. Um, for instance, there's one of the stories from the Bible of a guy who wants to come and study the Judaic religion and he has to actually take soil from Israel back with him because the religion was tied to the ethnicity and the land. Interesting. And I find that's probably the most helpful way because sometimes you'll see definitions like paganism meaning rural or something. And it's like, well, paganism was still being used at the term where religions today we would call pagan were the dominant temple religions of Greece and Rome. So that's the way I like to think of it, those religions tied to ethnicity, culture and community set against those that were cosmopolitan. You know, anyone can be a Christian, whereas to be one of the, um, you know, to follow the Celtic traditions, you'd actually be part of the Celtic world and part of that community and that society tied to that landscape. So they kind of use it almost to identify us versus them? Originally? Very much so. Yeah, and that's how it certainly became used in the uh, Christian era. It became there are those who follow Christianity of one of its various forms, there are heretics who follow divergent forms of Christianity, and there are pagans, which are those who don't follow uh, the Christian tradition. Indeed, pagan was even used to describe Muslims and so on at different points in history. Now, Dr. Waldron's entering the danger zone. This is an impromptu question here, but um, <laughs> paganism emerged with Christianity, we know that Constantine yes. kind of started that whole ball rolling. Yes. Um, wh where does it fit in there in your concept here? One of the interesting things I find with this, and you often get that today with modern neo-pagans that I'll talk about shortly, people will look at the past, particularly the late Roman Empire, and they'll see it in terms of there's this nice clear wall between here's Christianity, here are the pagans, and never the twain shall meet. But of course, they merged together. They merged together officially through Constantine, where a lot of Roman public holidays, a lot of um, Roman traditions, Roman fashion. If you think about it biblically, there's all sorts of prohibition about, for instance, doing what I'm doing, wearing a goatee, you know, trimming the hair between my beard and my head. Um, you know, we follow what we think of today as very Christian culture is very Roman. You know, they merged them together. A lot of our Festivals and dates are very Roman influenced. A lot of the paraphernalia of the Catholic Church was Roman derived. At the same time, in outside of the major centres of learning, um, this is something brought up by uh, Carlo Ginzburg wonderfully in his book Ecstasies Deciphering the Witch's Sabbath. In rural communities, they kind of just merged together in a sort of mix of Christian and uh, pagan folklore, thoroughly integrated, where pagan traditions were interpreted in Christian terms and 
Christian orthodoxy was interpreted in the terms of their particular faith. Indeed, you'll see that today even in places like uh, rural Mexico, where they're Catholic, if you ask them they're Catholic, but they'll have a whole bunch of old Indian traditions integrated into their Catholicism. Interesting. Kind of like Cubans, they have Santeria. Yeah, very, very much so. Uh, I watched this wonderful documentary in National Geographic a while ago, and they had a, um, a very uh, a guy who was ethnically Mayan in southern Mexico, and he was sacrificing chickens to St. Bridget. And they were talking to him about, you know, what's your religion? I'm a Catholic. I'm a very good Catholic. Look how many chickens I've sacrificed. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> And you get a lot of that kind of thing in medieval Europe. So you ask the person, they're a Christian, but they'll be there doing stuff to ward off the fairies and so on. So let's go. Uh, what is the definition of neo paganism? Is this a new movement that started recently, or has it been around for a while? Um, now, this is there's different ways to look at this. Now, the general term neo, um, it's a disputed term in, in contemporary pagan communities because it emphasizes a break between modern revivalist paganism and the paganism of, of antiquity. Now, what you'll find from that is that. Um, there is indeed a break, but of course it's a complex one because all that folklore became integrated into Christian communities and it's not a very clear boundary between them. But the other side is that there isn't any, none of the contemporary pagan movements such as Wicca and so on have a direct lineage through traditional folk uh, pagan practices. Rather, they're an integrated melange of all sorts of things that came about in the modern era. The first of these, we start seeing uh, splinter groups out of Freemasonry in the 19th century. Uh, Yolo Morganug was one of the first of them. That was the uh, writing name of Edward Williams, who was a Welsh nationalist. And he integrated his Freemason ritual with Welsh nationalism and the fragmentary romantic image the Welsh had of Druids and used that as sort of a way of emphasising Welsh nationalism against English. And, of course, from that we get things like the Estedford and many other um, Welsh nationalist traditions today. And there are a number of these, there are a number of English ones as well that started up emphasising uh, Druidry and most of these are an integration of Freemason rituals with uh, Welsh, English, Scottish folklore. Later on um, we get, you know, really the uh, where it became sort of a popular movement with Gerald Gardner writing in the 1940s and 50s and in particular Witchcraft Today he wrote in 1953. He was also um, in the Masonic community and integrated Masonic rituals with English folklore and a number of other practices he picked up in his studies as an anthropologist. And he created, well, what we call today Wicca. And then there are a number of other splinter groups who followed uh, suit, the Alexandrians, for example, and it became integrated with the New Age movement in the 1960s, and then we had dozens of different movements. There's also a German nationalist version, such as Asatru, which tried to re recreate the Germanic paganism of the Vikings. Oh, really? So there's so many of these. And they also run the full political spectrum. Um, this is the other problem, too. Uh, there's very, uh, there's Dianic witchcraft, which has a very feminist, radical feminist orientation, very strong emphasis on the goddess. Asatru tends to be very... Um, depending, again, which group you're in, very male-dominated, there are strands of that that extend into ultra-right-wing nationalism, but there are also some uh, that are quite uh, left-leaning as well. There are um, reconstructionist paganisms who actually go about trying to go over archaeological notes, trying to recreate the practices of the past. There are eclectic neo-pagans, and they'll grab bags from everywhere. I came across one group who used Star Trek characters as their, as their deities. They said all that matters is that they're archetypes. So you grab archetypes that will have meaning to you and you're trying to consciously connect with those archetypes rather than it being about uh, a literal deity. How fascinating um, is that? And, yeah, and then there's Jungian. Um, Vivian Crowley particularly writing in the 70s and a number of pagans did this, uh, uh, overtly took Jung's archetypes and said, so therefore all goddesses are the same because they represent Jung's archetype of the mother goddess and they specifically and quite deliberately use Jung's model of archetypes to create a pantheon. And again, for those, they argue it's a psychological exploration of archetypes in the human consciousness, or collective unconscious, if you want to use Jung's terminology. Hi. 
Welcome to Autolante. This is Autolante Recovery, and my name is Yvette Kuglin, and I'm part of the staff. Adelante Recovery Center has helped people in dual diagnosis for five years. We accept most PPO insurances and provide luxury accommodations and 24-hour support. To speak with an admissions counselor, call 1-888-242-4457. A lot of time we don't even know what's wrong with us and sometimes we need to get away to figure that out. So if you want to go for a little retreat out in Corona Del Mar, which is a confidential location, we're here to help. So we're only a phone call away. Thank you. Are they doing this to create meaning in their life, to uh, have social connectedness? What's going on here? Oh, there's, there's all sorts of combinations. And again, it depends which ones you are. One common theme, though, particularly in the early nationalist ones, and you'll get this a lot in um, groups like Asatru, is anxiety over ethnic identity. A lot of these pagan groups came developing in the 19th century were closely tied to Romanticism as an artistic, literary and philosophical movement. And the overriding issue for these people was that the countryside was being, you know, ripped asunder. Huge numbers of people are being taken out of the rural villages, farming life, and they're being sent to, to factories. In Australia's case, you know, hundreds of thousands of people were sent over to Australia, you know, over the 19th century. And, you know, traditional rural life was break, broken up. There was a real anxiety that people would lose their ethnic identity and their cultural heritage. So we get the development of folklore as a discipline in this period, and what they're trying to do is preserve what they saw as, you know, the dying fossils of their cultural heritage through recording it. Um, uh, uh, Elliot Rose, in his book Razor for a Goat, he has this line where he says, uh, was it, people were sorry to see England going to the dogs after the war and they were trying to work out what does it mean to be English if you're not Pax Britannia, if you're not the British Empire. That's an interesting point. <laughs> yeah. I'll have to ask my what English buddies later. Yeah, exactly. And so those sorts of issues, preserving their, their ethnic identity became quite crucial. So one of the major drives, and it certainly is the case in Asatru, is to try and create a very clear cultural sense of ethnic identity. And then they're reaching for psychology, they're reaching for folklore, they're reaching for anthropology in terms of constructing ritual and tradition to create a sense of community tied to ethnicity. And you'll often find, you'll find an Italian pagan and they'll be quite into, say, Strega and Italian folklore and heritage and appropriating that into their practice. So that's one group. Um, a common thread in this is um, an antipathy to, oh, look, to be fair, I call it a caricature of Christianity and Islam and Judaism, a caricature in that it sees it as patriarchal, dominating, inherently controlling controlling sexuality, controlling um, social structure, controlling the role of women and so on. And I call it a caricature because, of course, in all those traditions, they're as diverse as everything else. Um, but it's seen in opposition to Christianity and a Christianity that's configured as ruthless, controlling, repressive and hypocritical. Let me ask you this, um, go ahead. Let me ask you this quick question. What is Wicca? I know we cover this territory, but what is Wicca all about so people get an understanding of that? Well, Wicca is uh, the group, initially it was the group organised by Gerald Gardner and it's where you get Gardnerian Wicca from. There's different types, but Gardner's the root of it. And Gardner argued, following the work of folklorist and historian Margaret Murray, that the witch trials of medieval Europe represented the persecution of a pre-Christian fertility cult. And so she argued that while it's demonised in Christian mythology, there was a surviving cult of people practicing traditional Anglo-Saxon paganism in medieval Europe. And so she argued you critically read through witch trials and so on to construct an image of what this would have been like. And this is also based in the work of uh, James Fraser, who made similar arguments about cultural fossils of the past tied to a fertility cult that extend through to the present. So Gerald Gardner claimed, and this is a very, very disputed claim, I'm quite dubious myself, but his claim was that he came across a secret coven in New Forest in England who were practising this fertility cult since time immemorial, uh, was initiated into the group and when he started Wicca, the idea was this was the original pre-Christian fertility cult. 
And of course, wicker coming from the Saxon term meaning to bend, though there's different etymologies of that, and tying that to the idea of witchcraft. So that you call yourself a witch saying that you're a member of this pre-Christian fertility cult that he argued extended back into um, prehistory. Now, Wicca, do they, do these women, I'm assuming it's just a woman-only club, um, is it? That's not all women only. There's a priest and a priestess, so there are feminist versions that are women only. Do they yeah. believe or do they claim that they have supernatural powers? I'm just picturing right now my daughter's little book and I see a witch flying around with a broomstick. Or is that completely yeah. just Hollywood and they're actually staying with more of the fertility aspect? Um, look, I would suggest um, most witches I know and encountered and dealt with in research and even, you know, numbers I think of as friends would feel that they have supernatural powers but not in the sense of like, you know, shooting lightning bolts like in Dungeons and Dragons or something. Rather, things like, you know, tarot reading, things like um, essentially prayer, ritualized prayer. Okay. So they don't you have... want someone to go well at a job, you'll go and do a ritual. And essentially, and they'd actually probably say this themselves, it's the same as when a Christian goes to pray to hope that they get a good job or life is well, well for them. Um, again, it depends. I've seen some extraordinary examples. There's a woman called uh, Laurie Cabot who uh, um, she goes around with a lot of paraphernalia being the witch of Salem and so on um, in the United States. And she wrote in one of her books that, you know, witches could get together and do a spell to protect American troops aboard. And um, uh, Gerald Gardner, for instance, claimed that the witches in England got together during World War II and stopped the Nazis invading through doing magical spells. That's a good so, claim. There is, is a lot of that. Um, I must say the idea of, as she argued, using spheres of pink light to protect American troops against um, Saddam Hussein struck me as a bit um, of a risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was but, a risky one to put out there. <laughs> but it, the thing is, though, of course, it is, if you put aside, of course, the easy way it is to mock these kind of things, you're, you're expressing metaphorically, you know, a desire your troops come home alive, that they go well, that you're thinking positively about them. And look, most Wiccans I know would frame it the same, frame it as um, we're doing what Christians do when they pray. Is there any crossover with Satanism at all, do you think? Look, very little. Um, there's a little bit of grabbing similar imagery, and part of that is grabbing imagery that's deemed to be inimical to Christianity. And of course, Satanism's a whole ball and uh, a whole other game itself. Um, most Wiccans, though, if you ask them, would say, I can't be a Satanist because to be a Satan, I'd actually have to believe Christian mythology. Oh, that's an interesting point. I didn't think about that. And yeah. we've got a couple of minutes left, and I wanted to explore a little bit uh, Easter, because that's one of the big pagan that's holidays, I think, Easter and Christmas and Valentine's Day. Can you give yeah. us a brief rundown of those holidays? Well, look, Easter's a complex one. There were festivals like Ostara and so on happening. That being said, um, oh, gosh, I've forgotten the Roman scholar's name. Um, there was a particular Roman uh, writer at the time who talks about, though, the construction of Easter in Christianity in Constantine's day and sitting there with the bishops talking about how it's constructed. Um, I think it's a mistake to sit there and try and say, Easter's a Christian or a pagan festival. All these festivals are an integration of all kinds of factors over a long period of time. It's both. It's a Christian festival which has pagan elements to it. Um, it has pagan elements. So when we say paganism, of course, it's not historic paganism. It wasn't one religion. It's got Norse elements in it. It's got Roman elements in it. It's got Greek elements in it. It's uh, an integrated whole. Much the same as Christmas. You know, it's um, situated on Mithras's birthday. It's tied to the solstice, of course. At the same time, um, it has been thoroughly appropriated and Christianized and has deep resonance for Christian people. And I think, to me, it's a mistake to play the game of trying to appropriate festivals. All festivals are uh, a bricolage of all kinds of cultural elements over a very long period of time. And, and I don't think, I think it's actually very lovely that they are this bricolage because there are, you know, we use fest festivals as a way of connecting to formative moments in our people's heritage. And to see all those elements coming together, it's like a little history lesson where you can see the journey of a people through the rituals. Uh, Easter is always fascinating because it has become commercialized. I think you have a great point. We shouldn't try to mm. identify them or link them to one religion in particular. Um, but Easter is always funny because I never could figure out the bunny, 
with an egg <laughs> and Jesus. And the chocolate. <laughs> and the chocolate. <laughs> yeah, every time I ask people, how do those four relate? And they just kind of give me the stare. Of, yeah. I don't know either. <laughs> Once again, thank you so much, Dr. Waldron, well, for being on The Circle. Here are the books. Definitely want to get them. The Sign of the Witch, Shock the Black Dog of Bungie, and Snarls from the Tea Tree. You have to get them, Dr. David Waldron. Thank you for being on The Circle. Thank you so much for joining us. And you, everyone, thank you for joining us as well. Remember, our motto is simple. Wherever there's psychology involved, even where witches are, we're there. See you next time, everyone.